something that we did in in 2017, I think that was also instrumental, is we did um, collective bargaining reform in uh, 2017. And really the only thing that our unions, the teacher unions could bargain for was wages. And it was capped at either 3% or a cost of living rate, whichever was lower. And if they, they could bring additional things to the table, but both parties had to agree on that. The other thing that we did as part of the collective bargaining reform was uh, paycheck protection. Uh, no longer can they deduct from their salaries. They have to actually write them a check or they have to make the decision uh, to to support the unions, and then they have to recertify every time there's a new contract. So, you know, we like to say that we took on you know the largest monopoly in the state with the teachers union, but it was the second one that we took on because in 2017 it started with um, collective bargaining reform. <laughs> Dave Rubin and joining me today is the 43rd governor of the great state of Iowa, Kim Reynolds. Governor Reynolds, welcome to the Rubin Report. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it very much. It's great to be with you. It's good to be with you. I'm glad you're here. I've seen you a couple times here in the free state of Florida over the last couple months. You've done some blueprint, some Florida freedom blueprint events with Governor DeSantis, but we haven't really got to chat too much. So I thought we'd do a little kind of get to know you and then we'll get into the the nitty gritty of policy. How does that sound? That sounds great. That sounds so, great. So for the people that, that don't know you at all, what, what should they know about Kim Reynolds? Where's Kim Reynolds from? What's going on here? Well, okay. Well, I'm a small town, <laughs> rural Iowa girl, and we like to like talk about that a lot because, you know, Iowa's an agricultural state. I like to say we're actually one big, small community. Uh, it's a population of about 3.2 million. We have 99 counties. Um, my dad uh, went straight into John Deere and farmed out of high school. My mom stayed at home. Uh, but let me tell you, she ran the house and threatened uh, you know, us with everything if we didn't do what she told us to do because dad was coming home at five <laughs> uh, to set us straight. But uh, because I, was, I grew up in a small town, small school, uh, I participated in everything. And little did I know how well that was going to prepare me to do what I'm doing today. So I was involved in every sport, every activity, anything that I could do. Um, but that, again, I think that helped prepare me for um, a career moving forward. Um, so, what, possessed, you know, I think, what possessed a small town Iowa girl to go into politics? Well, well, my husband challenged me. So, you know, that's what for, I've been in the private sector. I started working. We moved uh, from Mount Pleasant to, to Osceola. Uh, I started working in the county treasurer's office. And I just, I was like, oh my goodness, uh, they don't know about customer service. All of the processes were so antiquated. And, um, you know, I, I shared that with my husband over and over and over for the next four years. Lo and behold, the county treasurer decided not to run again for reelection, which never happens. And Kevin, basically my husband said to me, well, Kim, listen, you either run for that job and you implement all those wonderful ideas you've been sharing with me for the last four years, or I really don't want to hear another thing about it. And I just didn't know anybody that had ran for office. I never really thought about it before, but I did. I talked about what I was going to do. I loved, I loved it. The first thing I did uh, was tore down the wall between the two offices. I'm all about breaking down barriers and working together and serving uh, the people that were elected to serve. And so it started by breaking down the wall and little, it's kind of been a theme of mine throughout my uh, career. But I, I, I worked there for 19 years, loved what I did. I think it's always important to bring new leadership in. And so I stepped out of a lot of the national things that I was on and they approached me to run for the Senate in 20, uh, 2008, not a good year for Republicans. And I thought, <laughs> no, I like what I'm doing. And I thought, you know what, I can take, you know, what I've done in the county. Uh, it was a large, largest geographical rural a Senate district. It was actually seven counties. Uh, it was about two hours from one into the other. And I hit the road and I started talking to people in the district, talking about what I thought I could do for them, how I could be a voice for them. Lo and behold, I was one of the few, 18 uh, in the Senate. We were in the minority that got elected. And so I've served in the local government. I've served in the state legislature. I've served in the minority. I know what that's like. Um, and what you have to do to try to just have your voice be heard and to represent the people in the your, the people that you serve in the minority. And then Governor Branstad asked me to run as lieutenant governor, and here I am. Uh, he got appointed to, uh, I'm trying to condense it, it's hard to Yeah, yeah, that. no, this is but good, I this mean, is I'm, good. I'm I feel like we're on a game show. The, the best, <laughs> you know, the, the, the vast um, uh, Kim Reynolds story. Uh, he, got a, he got appointed by President Trump to serve as the ambassador to China. 
And so I had the opportunity to step into that role and I fulfilled the last year, but I immediately had to run for um, the 2018 election cycle, which again, was not a great year for Republicans. Uh, we went, uh, we lost uh, seats in, the, uh, in Congress and uh, I was running against a self-financer. I am a very hard worker. Uh, and again, I, I raised the money that I needed to raise. RGA actually helped me get across the finish line. But um, I told Iowans what I was gonna do. And when I got elected by two percentage points, I went to work. Uh, I'm a little bit of a change agent, uh, not just for the sake of change, but for a purpose. And I'm really proud of what we've been able to do uh, in four years. And I think that was one of the reasons that, you know, this election cycle, it wasn't just two points, it was 20. <laughs> so evidently, I think Iowans appreciate the direction that we're taking the state. And it's been fun. It's been really fun to work on big, bold ideas and, uh, you know, work with the legislature, get it done, and to go back to Iowans and said, here's what I said I would do. And here's what I did. And we're just getting started. So, you know, we're not done yet. <laughs> so were you were you exactly at 20 points? Do you know if you were Governor DeSantis was uh, like 20.1 or 20.2? I would yeah. assume there's some sort of bet involved there. I know because, you know, we're constantly looking at what each other's doing in each of our states. And we align fairly well on different policies that we put in place with the way we handled COVID. So he probably beat me by just a little bit. I didn't get <laughs> one of my state um, uh, depart uh, state uh, wide candidates. We flipped two 40 year incumbents. Two wow. 40 year incumbents. We were uh, there were only three statewide races that flipped. Um, Governor Lombardo was one, and then we had two in Iowa. Our attorney general and our state treasurer. Uh, for the first time since the late 70s, I have a Republican attorney general. It makes it a lot easier when you have a, a egregious, overreaching administration um, and you're trying to protect states' rights to have uh, an attorney general that's willing to back you uh, in that process. So let's talk about some of the things that you've done because you know people usually focus on, well, now Florida and, and say Texas as like the freedom states. Uh, but you guys are really leading probably more than anyone else when it comes to education. Can you talk about what's going on yeah. there with school choice and why you decided to even get in that fight? It's not the most fun fight to be in when you're fighting teachers yeah. unions and everything else. Well, I feel I'm so passionate about it. I've been working on it for two years and we've made progress over actually the last four. We expanded charter school. We ex expanded open enrollment. Uh, I had school choice language uh, for the last two years. I got it through the Senate only to have it be uh, stopped in the house. And I made the decision this last election cycle, I was either gonna be an enabler or I was gonna get involved in some of these primaries. The chair of the education committee in the house blocked it for two years in a row and I'd had it because parents were telling me as I traveled across the state, they overwhelmingly supported parents having the choice of where to send their child. And it shouldn't just be for those that have the financial means to do it, that every parent should have that choice. And so I got involved in nine primaries. Uh, we were successful in eight of the nine. And the ninth one, I'm proud to say, supported school choice. He was a yes vote. We met right after the election. And I talked to him about why it was important. And, and he just really hadn't weighed in and didn't, didn't want to take a stand on it. But uh, because of those changes within the first two weeks, and, and actually it's the best bill of the last uh, two years. We were able to, in two weeks, pass a universal school choice. I get there in three years, boldest in the, in the country. Uh, and so, uh, and, and at the same time, we also uh, put into account, I think, providing some flexibility, long overdue flexibility for our, our public schools. It's critical that we have a strong public school system. This is not a zero sum game. It will elevate all of um, education. I firmly believe that. Um, but we were able to get that across the finish line. And so, and we've led a, I think, a school choice revolution across the country. Sarah Sanders, bless her heart. Yeah, it's yeah. our exact language that she <laughs> passed. Uh, Utah is in, you know, Ron is going to get it done. He's going to Universal. Greg Abbott is talking about it. Governor Stitt is working on it. So it is, it's incredible to actually just see this happening and building uh, across the state. I'll share one other thing. I'm, I'm, I'm talking fast. I apologize about that. But something that we did in, in 2017, I think that was also instrumental, is we did um, collective bargaining reform in uh, 2017. And really the only thing that our unions, the teacher unions could bargain for was wages. And it was capped at either 3% or cost of living rates, whichever was lower. And if they, they could bring additional things to the table, but both parties had to agree on that. 
The other thing that we did as part of the collective bargaining reform was uh, paycheck protection. Uh, no longer can they deduct from their salaries. They have to actually write them a check or they have to make the decision uh, to, to support the unions. And then they have to recertify every time there's a new contract. So, you know, we like to say that we took on, you know, the largest monopoly in the state with the teachers union, but it was the second one that we took on because in 2017, it started with um, collective bargaining reform. Just to, just to give the devil his due, what's the intellectual argument against school choice at this point? I mean, we see it now happening. You just mentioned some of the states that it's happening yeah. or it's about to happen yeah. in, and I sense that virtually all the red states are gonna go that way. But beyond just sort of like the simple argument of the teachers unions just wanna keep their power, is there, is there an intellectual argument for it at this point, do you think? No, um, but, but what was the hardest struggle for me? And I think you're hearing this consistently, Dave, honestly, in a lot of the states, it's your rural school districts. You know, a lot of times they don't have the opportunities of a choice or they feel that if it comes in, it's gonna destroy them. And I said, that's absolutely not the case. Um, so the this is the hysteria that the media creates and the teachers unions. I mean, Randy Weingarten came after me and in, in that press release that she, sent to Fox News, which I don't know why she decided that to be the outlet, but she did. Uh, she didn't mention children once, not once. But when I sat down with rural superintendents, I said, look, I'm not here to change your mind. I know I'm not, but I can guarantee you this is not a zero sum game. It will elevate all of education. But tell me, what are we doing as a state that's prohibiting you from being innovative and creative and, and, and feeling like you can compete? And every one of them pointed to chapter 12. And what that is, is just the shells of all they need to do. And, you know, as government, we add, 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 and we never take anything back. And so it's like, we're so restricted, we can't do anything. So I changed most of the shells to a May. We looked for redundancies. We really alleviated a lot of things that they thought was a problem. And then they said, we can't be competitive when it comes to teacher salaries. And so what we did is we allowed some flexibility and some unspent programs so that they can take that money, increase teacher salaries, bring on additional teachers and be more competitive. And I've promised them we'll go back and continue to look at some of those regulations, the regulatory environment that they're operating in and see if we can continue to drive innovation, give them some flexibility, much like the charter schools that are under the public school system. But I think like everything else, they, they you know, the hysteria when we cut taxes, we were going to destroy government, we were going to mm -hmm. destroy education, you know, the, the, the world was going to cease to exist. That, the way I handled COVID, when I got the kids back in the classroom, we were going to destroy, you know, kill the kids, kill the teachers. So, you know, we've proven over and over and over that the hysteria, the hysteria is not true. And so once again, we're going to prove the media wrong and we're going to show that our kids are actually going to be um, the ones that reap the benefit uh, of, of really making sure they're in the right environment to be everything that they can be. How much coordination are you doing with some of the other governors that you mentioned there? Kevin Stitt and obviously Governor DeSantis and maybe Abbott, some of the other guys that are doing the similar things, because it does seem to me that most, let's say, conservative leaning people are kind of like, ah, the federal government, it's just broken beyond imagination. Let's focus on the states. That's what federalism is all about. But do you guys really coordinate this stuff and say, hey, I'll try it here first. Let's see what happens in Iowa on school choice. And then that gives, you know, Sarah a little bit of room to do it in Arkansas, et cetera. Yeah. Well, here's the great thing for the constituents that we serve. We are very competitive as governors. <laughs> and like the fact I had the sixth highest income tax rate in the country, I've brought it down to the fourth lowest when my when it finally goes into effect. Um, uh, but listen, I can't stop because 15 other governors this year have tax cuts in their policy. So uh, I can tell you what Ron talked about in his condition of the state. I can tell you what Sarah's tax plan looks like in Arkansas. I can tell you what Doug Ducey did with occupational licensing reform in Arizona. So there's no reason to just to recreate the will, but what I can see is what other governors are doing. And then, you know, or, and hopefully we're leading and we're providing some of those examples as well. I think we have with, with education, um, but, but we take that and then we adapt it to what works in our state. Like, I don't think, you know, um, Kevin's not able, I don't think this year to get to universal, but he's making the steps that we made in years prior to this. So, you know, he won't be done. I can tell you what his goal is. I've talked to him uh, as we get together in RGA and have the opportunity just to just to have conversations and talk about what we're doing. Um, it, it's, that's where we get a lot of the ideas and a lot of the consistency. So Sarah took our same uh, school 
or ESA program. And hers is I, almost, a, I think, exactly the same. But then she brought in a lot of stuff. I mean, she hadn't done got CRT, parental rights, some of the other areas that we've already passed or that we've passed this, this session to. She put it in one big bill, but it drives all of us to look at what we're doing and how we can be better and more competitive as a state because we all want to retain the people we have. We want we, workforce is an issue. So, you know, whoever's winning that argument and bringing people to our states, it helps our economy grow. It helps our businesses get the workforce that they need and ultimately it helps our schools uh, be more successful as well in our community. So it's, it's a win-win to have all of us kind of looking at how we drive that narrative. What, what else should people know about Iowa? Because I feel like Iowa kind of falls under the radar. And then, you know, there was, there was always the straw poll. The straw poll doesn't exist anymore, which I think is still shocking to a lot of people. I guess I it's know, just- I know, it's so fun. What happened? Why did it, why did it end? Oh. They just, it was too much? What, what was going on? Oh, I just think everything, you have a couple of crazy things that don't work as well. And then we always are, you know, people are always looking for some way to do things just a little bit differently. Uh, I'm so grateful that we were able to hold on, at least for the Republicans, the first in the nation caucus is so short sighted by the Democrats to let that go to protect a really weak president where I think it's like only 37% of the Democratic Party think that he should run for re-election. That drops to 23, according to the AP poll, I think for those under 45, even thinks that he should run for re-election. And they always, they turn their back on rural America and they wonder why they can't do well in the heartland of America, but yet they can't take the time to come to the state and actually talk to engaged Iowans who are knowledgeable on the issues. Uh, they, they do this very well. They ask the important questions. It really gives the candidates an opportunity to test their message. And, uh, you know, that's valuable to see what it's like to interact with Iowans to get the response from people that are paying uh, attention. But how do you, how do yeah. you balance that as, as governor of the first state that, you know, everyone's going to? I had Nikki Haley on last week. She obviously was just in Iowa. Uh, obviously, yeah. Governor DeSantis was there. I th- was Trump there as well in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, I, yeah Trump yeah. was there as I well. Think Ron oh, came oh, of on course Friday. he was, yeah. Right. So, how do you balance that? Because obviously, there's all these strange alliances kind of forming, and I'm sure there's some stuff yeah. under the hood and all that, and it's your state. <laughs> Well, I've made it very clear and I've told every one of them, you know, as the governor, I want everybody because it is the First Nation Caucus, so I want everybody to feel welcome. So I have said to every one of them, I will be happy to be with you uh, in the state of Iowa. I can help you let you know when we have events that I think it would be beneficial for you to be here. I'd love to do the state fair. Oh, by the way, we'd love to have you come to the state fair. Yeah. You don't want to miss it. It's it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So would be happy uh, to do that. But but uh, it just it doesn't serve the process well if you've got the governor leaning in on one of the races and and so and I and they just I encourage them to come back often and, and I, they get it it's been a longstanding tradition uh, with with governors and a lot of elected officials you have some that'll weigh in but but for the most part honestly the governor has stayed out because I just as my role it's to welcome them and make sure they feel like they have a fair playing field but to be helpful in any way that I can. And it's, it's, you know, it's such an opportunity uh, to get to really know the candidates. A lot of times the ones that aren't successful in getting the nomination often are brought into the cabinet. And to be able to have those personal relationships with the individuals that are running, it's helpful for my state as well. Uh, let's talk about COVID a little bit because you mentioned it briefly a few minutes ago. Uh, you guys basically were in that front end of staying open and not locking everybody down and, and all of that stuff. I mean, was that purely... Just gut instinct by you? Were you just not going to listen to all of the bureaucratic nonsense? Where where did that come mm-hmm. from? So I early on was able to uh, contract with Test Iowa, and I was able to provide a lot of the infrastructure that I needed and a pretty robust data collection system to provide data in this in in our state. And uh, yeah. fundamentally, from the beginning, I mean, we we closed down for a little bit in the beginning, you know, the fifteen days, and we'll be through this. I mean, everybody pretty much when we didn't really understand what was going on, what it mm-hmm. meant, how it was being spread. Uh, but as we were able to start collecting a data, and 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 one of the things that from the very beginning, you know, I produce our farmers and producers produce ten percent of the nation's food supply. I had to figure out a way to keep those processing plants up and going, and the food supply chain moving. And so we needed to be able to do the testing. We needed to be able to make sure those employees knew that they were working in a safe environment, uh, so we could keep things going. And then and then so as we collected data, but fundamentally. 
you know, I just put my trust in Iowans. I did a daily press conference. I was honest about the data. I told them what was going on. We talked about what you needed to do to help, you know, protect against it. But I put my trust in Iowans to do the right thing. And they did. And early on, it was obvious that locking down wasn't the wasn't the right um, decision. It was early on. It was obvious. I talked to parents. I talked to kids. I talked to you know, we did Zoom calls that, that I needed to get the kids back in the classroom. I got sued from some of our largest schools. And to see mm-hmm. the statistics from the schools that sued me, the kids that dropped out and were lost through all of that. And so we were in one of the best uh, fiscal shapes heading into COVID. We were one of the number one states coming out of COVID. And uh, our economy uh, is in a really good place because we kept our state for the most part open and moving. And we did it in a responsible manner. Uh, Ron and I were the first two states to actually say by law that 100% of the, the, the parents have the choice to go 100% online or 100% in the classroom. But that parent was going to make that choice on where they wanted their child to, to receive their education. And uh, it's reflected in the NAEP scores that came out. Uh, we, we, you know, we didn't drop. We actually rose uh, we still have work to do. So, you know, there's learning loss. I'm not saying that, but our kids are in a better place because we had them in school and we kept them safe. What kind of influx did you guys get of new residents after doing some of these things right? Because there has been a freaking mass migration across the United States. I'm, as you know, I'm, I'm one of them You're from Cali them. to Florida. I yeah. I know. So we're trying to find a better way to track that. Um, and our numbers don't don't even come cl- close to what Ron is seeing, um, you know, but we're, we're probably around 10,000 migration in. But but let me put that into context. Uh, Missouri is like, or excuse me, Missouri, Illinois has lost over 250,000 mm-hmm. uh, migration out. Uh, Minnesota is looking about 17,000 out. So the fact that we're positive and growing. And to your point, I mean, I feel like I got to get up. And so anytime I can get to Florida or I can get anywhere or I can bring candidates in where they're talking about Iowa and what we have going on here, we just have an extremely low cost of living, a low cost of doing business, our home ownership for young people. We lead the country because it's relatively inexpensive. They can start building that asset and equity in a home. Um, You know, our, our communities are safe. We back the blue. I did that in 2021. We had an extensive bill that really supports our law enforcement. And, and we, we, we um, are getting recognized. Cato just recognized Iowa as the most fiscally responsible state in the, in the country this year. And we, now get this. I don't have an ocean or I don't have sunny weather. I've got winters. But we are among the top 10 best states to live, work, and raise a family. Iowa made the top 10 list. So I always say, you know, you know we, we, we think this little state little state in the heartland of America, uh, people forget about it, but people are starting to recognize uh, what we have to offer here in our state. And it's been fun, I think, to drive that. We're not taxing our pension retirement anymore. We started that this year. I talked about reducing the tax. We're going to 3.9 flat and fair. And my goal is to get to zero. But I told Ron and Doug and, and Greg, I said, you know, okay, they can, Iowans can go down there for two damn months in the winter when we have cold <laughs> temperatures here. But by God, they're going to continue to be Iowa residents if it kills me because they're such a valuable asset. You know, we want them to stay in Iowa. So um, that was a really big deal for me to be able to get that passed and yeah, through the legislature. I want to jump back to something you said before. So, so 10% of the food supply coming from Iowa, you have to deal with all the COVID nonsense. And now I sense there's like a general feeling that all of our supply chain things are kind of breaking down. What kind of uh, issues do yeah. you have, you know, even post COVID, making sure that uh, the farmers are going to be able to farm and the federal government's not yeah. going to take land and just all the crazy things that seem yeah. to be happening? Well, we're watching it all the time. You know, you have a lot of talk about Chinese coming in and, and, and purchasing farmland. Well, we have been, we've had a ban in place. I mean, we recognize our role in feeding and fueling not only the nation, but the world. And we've had a ban in place to prevent them from buying uh, farmland, agricultural land in the state of Iowa since 1979. I think it's one of five states that really has some great model language that other states are taking a look at. I think there's a total of 15 now that have that uh, in play. So, you know, we got to make sure that they're not continuing to gobble up uh, American farmland. In 2013, we saw them come in and purchase Smithville Foods, which controls a lot of the U.S. pork supply and revenue. Um, so we need to just be conscientious of that. You know, we have the supply and a surplus, so we're fine. But then you take into account that 
and that the investors in all of this are controlled by the CCP. So it's state owned, you know, this is driven by the Communist Party, but you've got the war in Ukraine that's messing with the grain, uh, global tra trade with grain, you've got inflation, natural disasters, and so, and supply chain issues. You know, you've got an increased cost of input cost and how that's driving the cost of food. So we need to pay more attention to food security and what it means in this country. And we just can't be naive about uh, China's intentions and what they're doing, and especially when they're buying land next to military uh, installations. We've seen many attempts to do that or to stand up a windmill in Texas that allows them to get into the uh, into their grid. So, you know, we just need to pay more attention. Congressman Feenstra actually has dropped a bill. It's called the FARM Act. You know, they all have the acronyms, but to just bring more transparency to the purchases to make sure that the United, you, the Secretary of Ag is on that commission and that they're reviewing uh, uh, who's purchasing and what. It's an antiquated system and it doesn't, you know, it just, it does not timely and it's very complex with the corporation and the way that they can structure some of those purchases. So we need to take a look at that and we need to get serious about it uh, and, and put a stop to it. Um, you know, this farmland belongs to American farmers and, and we, we can't, you know, take that for granted. We need to be serious about this. How worried are you that you guys can do everything right, you know, in some of these red states or, you know, within reason, most of the things right. And that just because of the fiscal stuff that the government's doing and printing money endlessly and inflation going yeah. up and everything else, that it still is going to harm your citizens, even if you're doing right by them. Well, that's why I think 2024 is critical. I mean, right now our fiscal health is strong. We have significant surpluses. We're continuing to see uh, our economy grow. I think last year was about 11% growth. So we're continuing to see that, but you know, there it's, it, we're worried, we're watching. Um, and it's a concern. I mean, it's a constant fight against what's happening out of Washington, DC. I, I mean, the, the chaos, just the uncertainty, the overreach is ridiculous. And um, we can, it, you know, we're a resilient country, we're resilient people, but to see what's happening at the Southern border, to see, you know, he continues to pay people to, to, to not work. I mean, that is an issue. Uh, they're talking about raising taxes. They need to quit spending money. They need to unleash American energy. I mean, it's just, it's just everything is a battle. And, you know, I don't, we can survive two more years, but by God, we better get the right person leading this country in 2024 or, or we're in trouble. And just the weakness uh, on the world stage. I mean, you know, China's paying attention and uh, they're watching. And every day, you know, we see, you know, I, him fumble so many things, whether it's the Afghan Afghanistan withdrawal or the southern border or look what happened to Hong Kong. And then you've got, you know, his statements on Taiwan and not not once, but twice, but three times. And then his staff walks that back. The response to this by balloon was just embarrassing. I mean, every every person, every every we're hunting. We, we hunt. I've got know, the list. I've go. got the full list I right mean, here. Unbelievable. And now we got China brokering a deal with Iran and Saudi Arabia. It's just like, and I like, they're watching as he stumbles up the stairs, as he really, you know, confusion at the podium. I just, I mean, I take a breath every time he goes to a podium because I just like, they're watching and they are patient and they are planning and they are strategic. And so, you know, they're in it for the long game. So we need to, you know, I, where they seem to really thrive is if we're talking about, you know, woke ideology or indoctrination, and then they're all over it, you know, so they have the capacity to react. It's just in a weird place. You know, I mean, it's unbelievable every day what you see happening. So we're going to continue to cut taxes so they can help our people address uh, the increased costs and inflation and do everything that we can. But it doesn't, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have a partner? instead of somebody that you're working against every single day. You know, it's funny, I was about to say to you that I think we set a modern record because we went 27 minutes in an interview without saying the word woke, but you beat me to I it because, it. <laughs> because my, <laughs> my next question, I got two more for you, uh, but you've, uh, also, you've also led on women's sports and making sure that, that biological girls will compete against biological girls, something everyone knew was the right thing, say six years ago. Uh, but did you even want to get in this fight? And, and are you getting any pushback? Or at this point, you feel like you've you've secured this now? No, we've secured it. And, you know, I mean, it's just common sense. But here's the deal. There is absolutely no common sense coming out of this administration whatsoever. The fact that I have to put in a bill that parents are the primary, are, are the primary 
uh, responsible person for their kids is just yeah. uh, ridiculous. I have, we're putting that in legislation. Uh, that they are the ones that are the, in charge of their children. But, you know, I have three daughters. I played every sport. I started with that. We can end with this. So, you know, it's it's a fairness issue. Come on. I mean, female athletes, just, they, they deserve a fair competition. And there's just a physical advantage. And everybody knows that. But I had a great – we had a young woman. Her name was Ashley um, – Erzin, and she was phenomenal. She ran the 800 meter dash in high school, set the record, set the record nationally, was such a tremendous advocate for this. Uh, but the same day that she broke the record, set the record for the 800 meter dash, that, that same meet, the boys were running also, there were 85 boys that beat her record yep. at that same meet. It's just, I got a granddaughter who runs track. And the boys and girls run at the same time. All you got to do is look at the scoreboard. And so, you know, the good thing is, I'm telling you, uh, with all of the stuff that's happening, the Iowa poll has been pulling what we've been doing as a legislature and what I've been driving as some of my initiatives. And I'm sure they're just crying every single day that they have to release one of these. I'm going to have a uh, call and send you some of them. But they, by 60% of, of parents don't think that gender identity and sexual uh, orientation should be taught to kindergarten through sixth graders, sixty percent, and that's in Iowa, and that and just it, it's just on every single of the issues that we've really talked about and ran on, uh, Iowans support it, and they're supporting it by pretty significant margin. And you think that, you know, I thought that's what you hear when you travel, but then to have it confirmed, and you know, the Iowa poll is supposed to, you know, they're pretty pretty good, pretty spot on, uh, whether it was cutting taxes or supporting parents or. Uh, taking pop and candy out of SNAP. I mean, it's it, they they have really um, lined up and really validated the things that we're working on um, that they support it, and it's just it's just nice. I don't, I don't, you know, got to be careful of the polls. I mean, I guess you know, I love it because it supported what I, you know, what we're doing. But you know, a poll right. is a poll, yeah. and I don't govern, I don't govern by that. I mean, or I wouldn't have got involved in a primary, but I could hear it. I'm all over this state. But it, it, it did validate what I'm hearing from Iowans. And it was just kind of nice to see that and to read that. All right. I got one more for you. I sense you probably know where I'm going already, but I've seen you at a couple of these blueprint events with a bunch of other governors and senators. You know, there really does feel like there's this massive political realignment happening where there's going to be a real brawl in the, in the Republican nomination process. Um, I don't know that uh, anyone's been floating your name for anything, but it seems like you'd be a good piece of the puzzle uh, on that side of things. Like, do you have any national aspirations to that level? Are you just focused on Iowa? Or is this just the easiest question to give me a politician's answer? <laughs> Probably, you won't be surprised. I really <laughs> am just focused on Iowa. And you know, just everything that I've done, I've just really focused on what I was doing and just try to do the best and to really leave it better than I found it. And I've done that just through, whether it's a private sector job or whatever level of government that I've been involved in. And so um, like I'm coming back next year and I'm cutting taxes. We left it alone this year because we're watching the economy. I just passed a government realignment bill where I go from 37 executive branch agencies down to 16. Wow. I It is incredible. It will be transformational. Uh, I want to be a leader. So I wanted to get my house in order before I went into local government and told them we can't keep doing things in, like we are. Uh, we can't continue, continue to cut taxes and operate in the manner that we are. We have to be more efficient and more effective. And um, so, and it was an enormous bill. I got it through. Uh, both chambers. I, I got it through um, just this week. And so it's coming to my desk and it'd be about $214 million savings uh, over like three, four, three to four years. And that's probably conservative. So, so I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and we'll see what happens. I really made that one too easy. All right. When's the <laughs> Iowa State Fair? How about we end with that? When's the Iowa State yeah, Fair so that I can put it I, in the calendar? It's August. Is it set August 7th? I think is what it is. It's a whole August 7th. Days. All right. We're going to, we're going to see what we can do. We're going to send you an official invitation because we want to host uh, kind of what Ron did down with the blueprint. We want to bring some of the media in and just really have some fun. And there'll be a lot of candidates through. So I can guarantee it will be worth your time. The food is incredible. So diet before you get here. Just a word of advice. I've seen um, the pictures of the corn dogs. <laughs> I will not eat for a week beforehand. And no, I'll, bring, no, I'll bring the whole Florida crew. Awesome. I'm good with that. <laughs> Governor, you. I appreciate your time. And I'll see you in August.
Thank you. Sounds great. Bye-bye. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of mindless drivel, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.